Today, we are continuing our study on the book of Exodus. And the title for today, as you can see on the screen, what is it? God's mysterious way unveiling the purpose behind Pharaoh's hardened heart. How many of you had a day so utterly terrible that nothing seemed to go your way? I believe each one of us can recall a day that left us thinking, wow, that was an absolute, absolutely dreadful day. Well, let me tell you a story about a day that this young man had. Once upon a time, in a bustling city of Metropolis, there lived a young man named Alex. He was an optimistic and organized individual who believed in the power of planning. Little did he know that fate had a different plan for him. Alex woke up bright and early, ready to conquer the day. He had an important job interview, scheduled and was confident about his preparation. However, as soon as he stepped into the shower, the water turned ice cold. Freezing, he quickly rinsed off and tried to shake off the initial setback, hoping it wouldn't be a sign of things to come. In a rush, Alex got dressed and headed to the kitchen for a quick breakfast. He reached for his favorite cereal, only to discover an empty box. He got, an, he got annoyed, and he settled for a piece of toast, but burned it when the toaster malfunctioned. Determined not to let these minor mishaps get to him, Alex grabbed his keys and headed out the door. As he walked toward his car, he noticed a flat tire. Frustra frustrated but undeter undeterred, he fetched the spare tire from the trunk, only to find that it was also flat. Now running late for his interview, he, he decided to call a cab. But just as he was about to book a ride, his phone battery died. In a state of disbelief, he started walking toward the nearest bus stop. Just as Alex approached the bus stop, the bus pulled away, leaving him stranded. Feeling defeated, he checked the time and realized he had missed his job interview. He couldn't believe that everything was going wrong in a single day, determined not to let his bad luck get the best of him. Alex decided to turn his day around. He found a nearby cafe and entered with a a forced smile, the friendly barista, sensing his frustration, offered him a free coffee and a sympathetic ear. Alex decided to make the most of this unexpected break and started working on his laptop. But as soon as he opened it, he spilled his coffee over the keyboard, rendering it useless. How often do we find ourselves in a situation like this? We make an effort to stay positive, even when confronted with countless challenges and, and adversities in life. However, what do we do when it appears that things are only getting worse? Moses endured numerous challenges throughout his life. So let's take a quick look at his journey. At the tender age of seven, Moses was separated from his mother. An in, 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 this is a great challenge for him. Despite the difficulty, he didn't voice his complaint because he believed that God had a plan to deliver the Israelites through him. And when he attempted to assist his fellow Israelites who were being mistreated by an Egyptian, an accidental act resulted in the death of the Egyptian. 
Unfortunately, his people did not support him, and he was forced to flee from his home, spending the next 40 years in the wilderness. So if you look into the life of Moses, his life has been miserable. Now at the age of 80, Moses desired to retire from his role uh, as a shepherd. Throughout his life, he felt like a nobody, forgotten by his own people. And unexpectedly, God appeared before Moses and instructed him to go to Egypt. So Moses expressed his doubt, feeling inadequate as he lacked eloquence and did not consider himself as a leader. But despite of his concern, God disregarded his request and taught him to perform miracles. So Moses held some hope that the people of Israel and the Pharaoh would listen to him due to some supernatural uh, uh, nature of the miracle. However, when he approached Pharaoh, his pleas fell on deaf ears. Instead, Pharaoh intensified the suffering of the Israelites, causing them to turn against Moses. They blamed him, saying, why do you make our lives even more difficult? It wasn't good to begin with, but now it's worse because of you. That's what we see throughout the book of Exodus, chapter 1 through 6. And now we are at chapter 7 and verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourself, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servant. What happened? And it became a serpent. So finally, after all those unfortunate events, now he is able to demonstrate something supernatural. See, this is a power that God of Israelites, he has this power. Then what's the response? Verse 11. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantment. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpent. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rod, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not hit them as the Lord had said. So what do we see here? The Pharaoh called these magicians and they performed the same thing. One thing I just like to mention here with really the quick is that God is not the only one who performs miracles. Satan can also perform miracles. So when you see miracles done by people, but done by any entity, you cannot politely believe that they are from God. But anyway, can you imagine the trouble that came to the face of Aaron and Moses? They thought, this is it. But then the other guys can do the same thing. They must have, have been so embarrassed. I would have been so mad at God if I were Moses and Aaron. Like, if you are going to perform some miracles, then so you got to teach me something no one can do, Right? Why did you let me do something that only makes me embarrassed? And as a result of this, the Pharaoh's heart grew hard. Let alone it made the situation worse. Then the Pharaoh summoned his magicians. And here, 
after this, God is telling Moses, like, you know, I know how, you, how much you were, you were embarrassed, and I have something bigger coming. So throughout chapter 7 and the following chapters, what do we see? What is happening in Egypt? Now they got 10 plagues. Something really big. So let's do a quick Bible study here. I, 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 I'm not going to ask you if you remember what all the 10 plagues, I even myself had to look up. What was the first, second, and third? So what was the first one? The water turned to blood. So Nile River and the other water sources in Egypt were transformed into blood causing the death of fish and making the water undrinkable. So they were getting their food from the river, fishing and everything. They can't do that. They cannot drink the water. What is second? The plague of frogs. What's wrong with the flakes? The problem was they were everywhere. How many of you, by the way, like frogs? Raise your hand. So would you, would you carry them with you? Oh, Wow. How many frogs would you carry? <laughs> One. And here, they were everywhere. What if this room was filled with the frogs? How many of you? I mean, let's say you got a call this morning saying that now Milton as a head elder saying, hey, we have a problem. We have about thousands of frogs in our sanctuary. How many of you would show up? <laughs> and they were not on here. They were in their homes. They were in their kitchens even in their food. And also frogs are considered unclean animals in Egyptian culture and religion. They were associated with impurity and were not to be touched. Also, the, the, the frogs destroyed crops, consumed food supplies, and made it difficult for people to carry out their usual activities. And also, the constant presence of frogs, their croaking sounds would cause significant psychological distress. And what is the third plague? The plague of life. The personal discomfort, can you imagine that? It caused intense irritation and discomfort for the Egyptians. And lice and gnats are associated with poor hygiene and unsanitary, condition, unsanitary conditions. Also, they can transmit diseases. Their bites can lead to a skin infections, allergic reactions, and other health issues. What is the fourth plague? The plague of flies. And when I say lice and gnats, we're not talking about like this one swarm of lice and flies. No, they are everywhere. They are everywhere. Very dis it's very uncomfortable. And I mean, I mean, when you have these flies and gnats, I mean, do you think you can even sleep at night? You're going to constantly hit your face because you don't want the fly just like landing on you, sitting on you. Also hygiene and sanitation problems and also the impact on agriculture and, and livestock and, and psychological distress due to a constant buzzing and biting. And the thing was, the, the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian magicians were able to duplicate the first three plagues. So they were able to do the same thing. But now we go fourth and fifth. What is the fifth? The plague of livestock. What's the problem of this one? Well, number one, the money issue, you're losing your animal. And also food scarcity. You can't eat those animals who, that died out of disease. And this shortage could have led to food insecurity and increased the burden on already limited food resources. Also psychological impact, like you are witnessing this large number of dead animal bodies. And disruption of social orders. Like livestock ownership was a sign of wealth and social status in ancient Egypt. So the sudden loss of animals 
would have affected the social hierarchies and, and, and create a sense of instability within the community. And what is the next one? The plague of boils. This, these painful skin eruptions could have made even simple tasks very difficult. And also spread of such infections can lead to further complications, including fever and other related illnesses. Social and, and cultural, cult, cultural implications, because boys were associated with impurity and were considered unclean. And activities such as walk, work, household chores, and social interactions would have been significantly affected by this. And the constant discomfort, along with the social stigma and isolation, would have led to psychological distress, such as anxiety, depression, and feelings of shame. And what is the next one? The plague of hail. The destruction of crops. The threat to livelihood. Damage to the infrastructure and the property. Threat to human safety. It's like, it's like there's a bombing every day. You have this hail coming down from the sky. It's like bombing every day. And what is the next? The plague of locusts. The swarms of locusts descended upon Egypt devouring any remaining vegetation, leaving the land barren. The food security is gone, economic impact, psychological impact. By the way, um, you know, when I was in Korea, the locusts were small. They were like this big. By the way, do you guys eat locusts here? No? I mean, John the Baptist ate locusts, you know? <laughs> in Korea... People eat locusts. I, I don't see that anymore, but it's more like a delicacy. And after I moved to Oklahoma, I live, I mean, I, after I came here, I worked in Oklahoma. And, and the school that I worked at was at out of nowhere. They gave me this small the, uh, apartment building uh, to stay. And I had to walk a uh, large corn, corn field from the school building to my apartment. At night, as I was walking like, across in the corn field, something, things were hitting me very hard, like this. Can you guess what they were? They were this big locust. They were hitting me. That's when I kind of had this idea of this eighth plague. Not only them really like destroying the crops and everything, they're going to hit your body, flying to your faces and everything. And what is the next one? The darkness. The Egypt was covered in a thick darkness that lasted for three days, during which people could not see or move. And I'm not talking about like the darkness that when you go home and you turn off the light and but you can kind of still see, you know? No, this is like utter darkness that you can even see like something like right in front of you. And when I when I was in the army, this is training that I got because like when we were sent to like scout and do things at nighttime, literally, you cannot see anything. So this is how we were trying to move. You go one step, you do this. Another step, you do this. Why? Because you cannot see, even from this near distance. Can you imagine how uncomfortable the Egyptians were The darkness described in the biblical account was so thick that it could be felt. It was a supernatural darkness that the entire land of Egypt 
for three days, it was, it was in complete dark. This a- complete absence of light would have caused disorientation, fear, and a sense of helplessness among the Egyptians. And the last, what is the last plague? The death of the firstborn. The most devastating plague where the firstborn of every Egyptian household, including both humans and animals, died while sparing the Israelites who follow specific instructions for protection. And every single time, what happened? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But not only that, can you imagine like the whole, the, uh, the anger of the Egyptians? Think about it. When, when even today here, when the economy is going bad, what would people do? Okay, election time, right? They want someone to blame when the economy is going down. But not only for the economy, here now you see the life of the Egyptians were getting miserable. And they all knew that it was coming from God. Can you imagine the hatred and the bigotry that the Egyptians had developed against the Israelites? Can you imagine that? And now Moses is going through all that. And he's like, why? So here, um, the question that I have is this. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Have you heard uh, the, the term called Murphy's Law? You know, the young man named Alex, the story that I uh, shared with you at the be- beginning of my sermon. What if, after Alex gone through all those horrific things, What if somebody shows up and says, you know, actually, I set it up for you. I cut your tire. I emptied your cereal box. I cut the uh, the hot water. What if somebody says, I I actually set set that up? How would you feel? And I feel like God is almost like he's telling me, I set it up. I hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Why did he do that? And in here in the Bible, how many times did God harden the heart of Pharaoh? How many times? At least 10 times God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. I mean, it is worth noting that in some instances, the text also mentions that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And this also suggests a complex interplay between Pharaoh's stubbornness and God's role in hardening his heart. But the question is, why did God do that? He was going to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt eventually, right? He was going to do it anyway. Then... Why did God make it so hard for Moses and Israelite? Have you ever had this question? You have delivered me. I know that you're going to take me to home, that you have prefer, prepared for me. But then why are you making this journey so hard for me? Have you ever wondered? I've wondered many times, why is it so difficult? Can you just take me home? And and, and it it, it was like, I never had an answer until recently because I never got the sense of why. Because whenever people ask me a question, why do you think God hardened Pharaoh's heart? I'm like, I don't know. And then lately, a thought came to my mind. This has all happened because God was preparing Moses for something bigger in the future. 
even though now Moses, he's in front of Pharaoh, but he's still in doubt, right? Every single time he hits the wall, what does he do? He's finding and he's looking for excuses why this is not working. Like, did I not tell you that I'm not a good speaker? They're not listening to me. Every single huddle that he faces, he gets nervous. Is this going to work? Are you following? God needed to grow his faith for the journey ahead of him. I mean, do you remember how much the Israelites gave Moses hard time? How many times? Throughout the entire 40 years of journey, do you remember? The Israelites, how much they were giving Moses hard time. Each time Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then Moses now see how God is responding to it. Moses' faith was growing little by little. Do you agree with me? In other words, he's getting a tough skin a little by little. If God let Moses see that Pharaoh let the people of Israelites go without all these hassles, all the process that God had to let them go through, I don't think Moses would be able to endure 40 years in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. I think after maybe two years or five years, Moses would say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. Find somebody else. But God could not afford that. You are the one that I chose that you may lead them to the promised land no matter how many years it may take. And I realized that the reason why today I face the walls and almost I feel like God set the wall over there for me because God is telling me, Ron, I want you to grow because I have a much bigger plan in the future. And I may say, Lord, I'm turning 42. How much more? Well, God is telling Moses was 80. You know, <laughs> what it tells us is that age doesn't matter whether you're young or old. Sometimes, oh, I'm too old for that. Lord, I'm too old for that. And God says, it doesn't matter how old you are. I have plans for you. I'm like, I've been in the church for 40 years. Why is it still hard for me? And God says, I still have a plans for you. You never know the last 10 year, years of your life. Maybe God is aiming for that time. Maybe the last two years of your life, maybe God can use that time for you to change and transform somebody else's life. Amen. And God is now preparing us for that time. So, the question, why? When, 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 when your life hitting a wall, God has a place, the wall there, so that you can learn how to trust God. At first, you may be nervous and anxious. But as you keep trusting God, you will learn how to trust Him in the midst of bad situations. And you will eventually have unwavering faith that you need to, that you need in order for you to navigate through your journey to heaven. So we hear the word unwavering faith. The question is, do I have unwavering faith? And when I look at myself, no, because when I now hear some, some bad news, I already start to doubt. Oh, is it going to be okay? The reason why God is allowing us to go through this like Pharaoh's hardened heart in our personal life is because God has a great plan 
in his mind for us. God wanted to prepare Moses for the significant role he would play in leading the Israelites out of Egypt. So when you encounter obstacles in your life, remember that God allows them to teach you how to trust him. Gabriel is going to a summer canvassing program, and I remember my first summer. Do you think I was all confident? I said, you know, I'm, I'm young, you know, man here. I'm going to give them a big smile, and they're going to answer you know, their door, and they're going to listen to me. I was somewhat arrogant. You know, as long as I memorize my canvas thoroughly, as long as I know what I'm doing, as long as I keep the good manner and composure at the door, they're going to listen to me. And the, the, the reality was it doesn't matter. And once I get my first rejection, the confident here shrinks down. Second rejection, this. Third rejection going down after I don't even want to knock on the doors anymore. But the key was what? Keep going. Keep going. Press on. And little by little, little by little, I was getting tough skin on my face. But it took time. And also in my personal journey, this is my, I'm going to share some of my uh, experience and testimony. Because, you know, as a young man, when, when I, my first summer, I didn't know how to pay for my school. So canvassing, while I was canvassing, I was nervous, I was worried, I was concerned. And God was really teaching me how to trust Him in the situations that you have no answer for tomorrow. But trust that God is working today. And I share with you some of my test, uh, canvassing stories. I'm going to pass that. So my first summer, it went great. And, and, and I really had an amazing life-changing experience. And I came back to Andrews, and people were literally telling me, like, what happened to you during the summer? You look different. I was like, wow, because you know, I was always a rebellious kid growing up, even in the church, so nobody really saw me as like somebody, like spiritual person. And now, after my first summer canvassing, they were like, wow, what happened? They talked to me as if they could see uh, 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 Jesus through me. And guess what? How long it lasts? It lasts one month. <laughs> what happened? Satan started to whisper to my ear, Okay, Ron, good job. You worked hard for three or uh, 13 weeks to make enough money for one semester. What about next semester? I only got two weeks for the winter break. So you do the math. I did 13 week canvassing and made enough money for one semester. Would it be possible for me to make the same amount within two weeks? Yes or no? No. So when I got the conclusion, my spirituality was nose diving. So by the time, by the winter, when I went back to canvassing program, my spirituality was even worse than before the summer. And it was 2008 winter, so it was after the recession and all that, so uh, I was really good at truck stop. So I, I would go to truck stop and talking to the guys, the truckers and everything. And after I finished my first lap, then now I see new truckers there. So I just, I would stay there all day. But that winter, the truckers were getting no job. So they were just sitting there after my first lap, everybody I would talk to. So I was struggling and my leader told me, well, why don't you join us at least for the Christmas break? 
I mean, Christmas, uh, at least for the Christmas Eve, because people, they tend to give, you know, give out money, donations. So I joined them. And of course, other kids are getting good donations. They're, they're getting $500, $400. I think the guy who made the, the least was 180 So guess how much I made that day? Hmm? How much? Five dollars. I got thirty-five dollars. That's when I realized that I am the problem. Because when things are not going well, sometimes we tend to blame the situations and environments. Like and as a canvasser, I hear this a lot. Hey, you put me in the wrong neighborhood. People are mean here. They're not getting anything. Move me to another neighborhood. But that day, in the Christmas Eve, we were all at the same spot. Where were, where, where were we? We're at all at Walmart parking lot. Normally, we don't go to Walmart parking lot because when they complain, the managers would come out and kick us out. But Christmas Eve, you see the parking lot are packed. The managers don't have a time to come out and kick us out. So we all stay there in the same spot with the same crowd. Someone's getting $500. I got $35. Why? Because I was filled with the doubt. So after everybody's left, I decided to stay one more week by myself. And that was my time to wrestle with God. You know, when I came to the state, I had this plan like, you know, at, at the last day of the year, I really want to go to uh, the Madison Square Garden in New York. I want to see the countdown and everything. You know, that's some kind of things that you, you want to do when you're a foreigner. But in reality, I'm staying in an empty church, eating the leftover food that the other student left for me. But that's when I learned how to trust God. Because when I hit the rock bottom, now God is the only one that I can trust. Amen. Do you think I made enough money to come back? The story would have been great, like, yes. No, I didn't. It's like, same thing like Moses. Like, yeah, God was going to deliver them, but like now he had to go through all the hurdles, right? I didn't make enough money. And I came back to school, and I just pay a, paid a portion of my um, tuition. And then somehow I, I got through that semester, and I went back to summer program, Kind of same process again. I made enough money for the next semester. When the winter time came, now I didn't make enough money, so I still owe money to the school. But the thing is, I experienced the last semester when I didn't have enough money even to finish, even to register for the school. God helped me to go through that. So a year ago, when I had this $100 in my pocket and I could not buy any of Groceries for me. Why? Because what if something happens? I got to have something here. Following year, same thing happens, same amount of money in my pocket, but then I went to Walmart and bought groceries because I knew that God didn't want me to starve. I'm going to go eat. I'm going to buy food. And if I don't have money, he will provide. And then something happened. Why am I sharing this? with you because when you learn how you when you learn how to completely trust God now you're going to see how God is moving his hand in a very miraculous way so now satan is now looking at me and say, hey this guy i've been poking him but now he got enough tough skin so he's not really like doing this so that semester, spring semester, and at that time I had a car. I borrowed $7,000 from my uncle to purchase that car. And my uncle told me, and he's going to be here in my ordination, so you may get to see him. And, and he told me, yeah, what? 
you can pay the money back after you get a job. At that time, I was still in the school. I didn't have enough money to pay for the uh, full coverage insurance, so I only had a liability insurance. One day, me and two other students from Andrews, we were driving together from Andrews to Southern. I drove about six hours, and I got tired, so he offered, like, can I, I can drive for you. So I let him drive. And now we were at Dunlap, Tennessee. I don't know if, you know, it's just all the mountain area, curvy road, going down, like an hour away from Southern. And he wrecked the car. The car, like, flipped, like, sideways. And, and we had to uh, exit out of the sunroof. And when I was exiting, I knew right away that Satan was trying to discourage me. It was about the midnight. I was coming out, and I looked up the sky, and, and, and I said this, Satan, if you really want to discourage me, you've got to have something better than this. And I came out, and, and, and I spent the weekend there. I wasn't distressed. I had a good time, but the problem was now, how can I go back to Andrews, right? My car is gone, and I was like so broke, so I had no money to even rent a car. I mean, now you can simply say, well, why don't you rent a car and go back there? You know, why don't you get a bus or go up there? I, I was like so broke. So they were trying to figure it out, out, like how they could like take me back to Andrews, like okay, you know. And the reason why we were there is because we were recruiting students for the summer program. So I was just walking around the campus, and I saw religion buildings. So I walked in there, as so I was kind of like looking into classrooms because I, I, I had never been there, and I saw a guy in a classroom, and he was he looked so familiar to me. So I was like, what? Where did I see this guy? And I realized that he, I saw him at the seminary. So I was curious, well, was he, did he already graduate? Did he get a job here? Why is he here? So after the class was over, I walked into the classroom and said, hey, how's it going? I saw you in the Andrews. Like, what are you doing here? Like, and then he said, well, I just came down here uh, for the weekend. I was like, for the weekend? Are you going back to Andrews? He was like, yeah. So when? Today. And I said, can I go with you? So I got the ride. <laughs> so now I'm, I, I was like, I got the free ride, by the way. So we're driving together, and I was so curious, like, why he was there. Because it wasn't summer break. It wasn't winter break. It wasn't spring break. It's just the middle of the semester. There's no reason that he was, you know, he should be there. So I asked him, so why, why were you there? And he said, well, I was talking to a girl for the last uh, couple of months. So they were already like talking on the phone and, and he saw her pictures and everything. So he already developed his relationship toward her. So that weekend, it was her first, his first trip to come down to see her in person. So they met in person. And after they met, unfortunately, she turned him down. So this is what he told me. Ron, you may think I am helping you. But in reality, you are helping me. Driving back to Andrews alone would, would have been miserable. So like two guys like driving together, we were praying together, we were singing hymns together over there. I mean, it was a reminder of how God works miraculously when we remain faithful to him. We are living in one of those three stages. Number one, you just, no, you just got out of the storm in your life. Or you are right now in the storm. Or you are about to be in the storm. That's your life. So life is not learning about how to avoid the storm. But it is all about how to dance in the rain. 
One makes Christianity different from other religions. In many other religions, people seek their gods primarily for personal desires and wants. They pray to God when they need something, when they want something. However, in Christianity, we seek God to align ourselves with his will and purpose for our lives. We pray to God to listen to the voice of God. That's the difference. Other religion, they pray when they need something, when they want something. But we pray when we want to hear what God wants for us. It doesn't matter what lies ahead of us as long as we strive to follow God's plan. We will experience this mysterious ways in which he unveils the purpose behind the challenges we face then I can say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength because his strength is perfect.